who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the, the people, I, I would say, there is no patent. This is, could you patent the sun? <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, uh, wherever this finds you or wherever you're joining us from. Um, we are uh, about to have our last seminar in the Health Law Institute's seminar uh, series for this semester. And we're, and we're very lucky to have Dr. Marlies Rich Richter joining us from South Africa. Um, just before I introduce her and turn it over to her, um, that was her lovely suggestion to have folks enter the space with uh, a music um, riffing off of Jonas Salk's famous comments around patents and uh, important health interventions. Um, a couple of little logistical items to share with you. Um, first of all, uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulties. That's why we were a couple of minutes late starting. Uh, and getting the closed captioning going. I think it is now underway, although I'm seeing a little bit of conversation to try and uh, that suggests otherwise. So I hope by the time I'm done this little introduction, uh, the captioning will be in place. For those who are not familiar with it, you should be able to sort of turn captioning on through the menu of options in Zoom um, towards the bottom right, I believe, depending on the kind of browser you're using. Uh, so hopefully that will be in place momentarily if it's not already in place right now. Um, the second thing to note is that uh, questions, uh, we welcome them. It would be lovely to have a conversation after the presentation in light of it. Um, the way that that works logistically is to put your questions in the Q&A and then I as the moderator will go through those and put them through towards our speaker. Uh, so she can engage them and folks can hear both the question and the response. So feel free to put those questions in the Q&A during the chat as they occur during the uh, presentation as they occur to you. Uh, and then we'll have some questions to work with by the time uh, Dr. Richter is concluded her presentation. Uh, so I should have said off the stop, I'm, my name is Matthew Herder, by the way. I'm the director of the Health Law Institute uh, uh, here at Dalhousie. Um, we're pleased to have lots of folks joining us for this seminar today. Now about our speaker. Um, Marlies uh, has worked in the health and human rights field for over 20 years. She's served in several key South African civil society organizations and coalitions. She was, for instance, a researcher at the Project Literacy, the AIDS Law Project, the Treatment Action Campaign, the Reproductive Health and HIV Research Unit, and more recently served as the Head of Policy Development and Advocacy at Sanke Gender Justice. She holds a, a Bachelor of Arts Honours Degree and Master of Laws Degree from Wits University in South Africa and completed a, a Master's in International Peace Studies from the University of Notre Dame in, U, in the United States as a Fulbright, Fulbright Scholar. In 2013, she graduated with a PhD in Public Health from the International Center for Reproductive Health at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And, and her focus as that in terms of that PhD was on sex worker access to healthcare services in Sub-Saharan Africa. She's published in academic and popular forums in areas of law, bioethics, gender, migration, and public health. She holds a visiting researcher position at the African Center for Migration and Society at Wits University, and currently focuses on research, advocacy, and policy change in gender, human rights, 
and of course the COVID-19 pandemic with an emphasis on the impact of the criminal law on health access for sex workers as well. Um, her talk is incredibly timely. That would be true any day for the last several weeks with its focus on just using the title of her talk, ARVs, COVID-19 vaccine equity and intellectual property protection. It's perhaps particularly timely today uh, in Canada where uh, Health Canada, our regulator just approved uh, the Pfizer COVID vaccine, not that I should call it the Pfizer vaccine, uh, for children aged five uh, to 11. Um, so when other parts of the world are struggling to get their first dose of the vaccine, uh, we have it already being made available for children. Um, so there's a stark, perhaps, inequity there. And I'm sure doc our speaker will help us to think about that and, and, and work through those kinds of questions. So with all of that said, uh, over to you, Dr. Richter. We'll have a presentation and then usually by around one o'clock or so, start to move into a discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I just would like to check if you can see my screen. We just practice it, but I might have uh, I might have clicked the wrong screen. Can people see a full presentation, or is it still in presentation uh, in presentation mode? It's still in presentation mode, Marlies. Ah, and we just uh, let's see if I can do it now. Uh, Sorry, just give me a sec. Um, I'm going to try and project for my second screen. Perfect. Is that better now? Yay, yep. I'm glad. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm speaking to you from, from Cape Town in, in South Africa. Um, and it's such a pleasure for, for me to, to speak to you about uh, the topic of, of in, uh, intellectual property. Um, as Matthew's pointed out, uh, my background is, is much more general, um, and especially in the last 15 years, I've, I've been focusing much more on uh, sex work, health and human rights. And since starting my work at the Health Justice Initiative in, in January this year, um, I returned to some of the treatment access work um, that, that I started doing when I, um, when I was uh, very young and perhaps naive um, when I started working at the Treatment Action Campaign and the AIDS War Project um, and some of the work that we did there during the, the AIDS epidemic, um, I'm hoping to, to speak to a little bit um, in today's session. So I'm, uh, sorry, let me just see if I can move this on. Uh, the topic of, of today's uh, presentation is uh, mainly quite broad strokes around some of the lessons learned um, during the, the activism and the advocacy uh, domestically in South Africa, but importantly, the international partnerships that brought about a radical rethink of, of intellectual property and how, uh, how intellectual property uh, would be able to bolster um, health and human rights specifically. And I believe that some of some of the, the lessons that we we learned during the HIV epidemic um, are, partic are particularly important um, in the way that we are uh, that we are grappling with uh, with the COVID pandemic. A little bit about the, the health justice initiative, so that you have a sense of um, of from of the context and uh, the disciplines in, in which we work. Um, the Health Justice Initiative is a very small NGO. <coughs> we were established in, in July 2020. I, I joined this year. Um, and we look specifically at the intersection between racial and gender inequality. Um, and we focus mainly on COVID, TB, and HIV. And the, the work that we do um, always include the, the lens of health equity. Sorry, I just realized I need to stop here to just check if, if the live captions, if, if all of that is sorted and if there's anything that I need to do around that. Okay, um, I'm going to continue and I, I assume um, that everything is in order. What I thought that I would do um, to start off this discussion um, and to, to provide some of the, the context of, uh, of more than 20 years ago 
is to provide a, a short video um, around the initial work of the treatment action campaign. And the, the documentary is longer, it's about 20 minutes, but I'm going to only show uh, six minutes of it um, to, to talk a little bit about the treatment action campaign's work and then to juxtapose that to, to some, of the, um, some of the issues that uh, the global South especially is experiencing in terms of the, the COVID pandemic. What I'm going to do is to try and play it off my, uh, play it off my computer uh, as opposed to the PowerPoint. And I just want to check if everyone can hear this. ...died from AIDS-related complications in 1998. Simon felt that the Department of Health had not done its duty in providing treatment for people living with HIV and AIDS, and in his dying months, issued an angry call for action. We're not asking for everything. We recognize the government has a problem with resources. But we ask you one thing. Join our hands to fight the drug companies. Join our hands to raise money from the private sector. Join our hand in raising money from each of us who will contribute to save the lives of everyone who needs to be saved. At Simon's funeral, Zaki Ahmad called for the formation of a treatment action campaign. The first demand of the TAC was for a mother to child transmission prevention program. We held our first demonstration on the steps of St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town. At first relations with the Minister of Health at the time, Dr. Ngosa Zanazuma were friendly. In 1999, one month's treatment with antiretrovirals would cost between four and 6,000 rates. When most people only earned less than 2,000 per month, the minister was keen to see the prices made affordable for poor people. We started organizing branches whose purpose was to educate ourselves about HIV and AIDS. This was the origin of our focus on treatment literacy. It was through education about the scientific, social, and political aspects of HIV and AIDS that we could take control of the virus within us and of the pandemic as a whole. In 1999, Thabo Mbeki succeeded Nelson Mandela as the president of South Africa. Then the unthinkable happened. Thabo Mbeki announced the appointment of a presidential AIDS panel to investigate whether HIV was the cause of AIDS. Some of the people in this room to ask <clears throat> what, what is the cause? In 2000, South Africa hosted the World AIDS Conference. Welcome to the 30th International World AIDS Conference. The number of people living with HIV in South Africa had increased to nearly 4.5 million in 2000. Sub-Saharan Africa had become the epicenter of the epidemic, yet antiretroviral treatment was unaffordable for most in our region. The TAC organized a mass march for treatment access. The march mobilized global opinion in support of the call that patents and profits should not be allowed to prevent access to life-saving medicines. In a crucial opening address to the conference, Judge Edwin Cameron placed the issue of access to treatment on the agenda. I'm here, I'm able to be talking to you, I'm able to engage with you, I'm able to speak with you about this important topic because I'm on antiretroviral therapy. There are people throughout Africa, 25 million people in Africa and 34 million people in our whole world who are this moment dying and they're dying because they don't have the privilege that I have of purchasing my health. Where are the drugs? That's where they are. The drugs are where the disease is not. And where is the disease? The disease is where the drugs are not. During her term as Minister of Health, Dr. Zuma tried to introduce the Medicines Act, which allowed for wider access to cheaper generic medicines once the patent had expired. The Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association opposed the Medicines Act. 
the TAC organized a campaign against the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association in support of the government and the Medicines Act. We mobilized trade unions, religious leaders, and other NGOs to support the campaign. Faced with this opposition, the PMA withdrew. The victory encouraged the growth of the TAC. We call on the PMA to announce the sale of AZT to the government at 180 rand per one month course for a pregnant woman or rape survivor now. You ask us to announce a price of 180 rand for a course of AZT to treat a pregnant mum um, and a rape survivor. In other words, the what's called post-exposure prophylaxis. You also ask us to reveal our manufacturing costs. Now, I have to be upfront with you today and say right now, right here, we can't do that. TAC went to Thailand and brought back a generic version of Pfizer's fluconazole, a highly effective medicine in the treatment of oral crush. The generic version costs only 58 US cents per tablet, where Pfizer charged government $7 per tablet. In 2001, the TAC held... I'm just going to play a second short video. Um, give me a sec. This pandemic has brought everybody to the same level. Rich, poor, educated, uneducated, all of them crying out for the one little thing that we take for granted. Oxygen, air. Breathing seems like a basic human right, but when you have COVID, it's not. First, it was my mom who got infected. I had to go and buy the drip to put it myself because she was in such a bad shape. And when I was there still nursing my mom, I got a phone call that my daughter Valerie is sick. I started coughing and I was struggling to breathe. I was isolating myself and then my son wanted to come touch me and see me. My husband, he was also very sick. They are both just saying, we can't breathe, we can't breathe. I'm in Zimbabwe, we needed an ICU bed, we needed oxygen, and there was nothing. Good afternoon, Zimbabwe. I'm one of the specialist physicians in the COVID unit. Today has been a very difficult day. It feels like a bloodbath. Literally, since morning, there's been death upon death. The patients who are losing have not been vaccinated, and their condition progresses unabated until they can't breathe, they come to us very desperate. When my family was almost dying, there was not one single vaccine. It makes me really sad because this has been before and we lost millions of people to HIV. When in the West, people were already living normal lives. For how long are we going to sit and just look at people dying again? Since the pandemic started, we've lost a quarter of these patients. And uh, this is the only hospital providing critical care support in Northern Uganda. We have the poorest vaccination status of the whole world. Rich countries talking about going back to business is normal. And WHO has challenged them to stop this vaccine apartheid and to stop the boosters until everyone is vaccinated. We want them to share the vaccines, share the recipe so that countries like South Africa can produce vaccines for Africa. India is in the same situation. They can do it. It breaks my heart, those stories of people dying in the streets. It's so important that we vaccinate the whole world. I will continue to fight for access to vaccines until my own last breath. We have this entire misunderstanding of what Darwin really
Um, I just want to check that people could see my screen uh, with the presentation. Um, let me just see if I can share screen. Just blue background. Thank you. Thanks for all the for all the uh, the help. Um, let me just see if I can do a quick swap around. Is that better? Okay, I'm sorry, I can't seem to get the, the presentation back onto the second screen. Let me just try once more. Um, and yay, okay, thank you very much. Um, so that was a, a little bit of a roundabout way of uh, of giving some context to to some of the discussions that that we hope to have this afternoon, um, and what what I want to to start off with uh, specifically is the um, the devastation of the the HIV um, pandemic. And in two thousand, when I started working for for the AIDS Law Project, um, there were more than, more than 4.2 million people um, who had HIV. And the antiretrovirals that were available in the global north um, were completely unaffordable in, in Africa. And, and you heard the insert on the video uh, from Judge Edmund Cameron, who spoke about how he can uh, purchase health um, because he had a good salary but that it was completely out of reach for, for most South Africans. The Treatment Action Campaign um, used innovative legal advocacy, research, social mobilizations and uh, social mobilization and public education uh, to really challenge the global conversation on, on drug pricing um, and ultimately uh, to increase the access to people with treatment. And South Africa, we are proud today to have one of the largest HIV treatment programs in the world. The focus of the, the treatment action campaign um, and the AIDS law project was specifically the pharmaceutical industry and the abuse of intellectual property protections. There was a, a reference in the video to the Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Association case, the PMA case. Um, and in South Africa, there was an amendment to our Medicines Act in 1997, where uh, we wanted to increase um, the, the ability to, to have greater access to medicines. Um, and the pharmaceutical industry supported by the US government challenged the amendments to our, our domestic legislation, arguing that it was violating TRIPS um, and will return to TRIPS quite soon. Um, the major concern of the Pharmaceutical Association is that the, this new legal framework would allow for parallel importation. The Treatment Action Campaign joined the case and they made the argument around how the domestic amendments would uh, dramatically increase the, the ability of people with HIV and AIDS to, to access medicines. Um, and the, the organizations were joined with demonstrations around the world. There was great global solidarity. Um, during the, the hearing of the case, there were more than 5,000 people who marched to the court. Um, and there was engagement of activists in South Africa and globally uh, around the issue of, of, um, of this case. Um, the PMA eventually withdrew their case and some of the, some of the analysis of the, the, the 
the campaign and the strategies around it uh, point towards the, the synergies around litigation, mobilization, and, uh, and education, and especially how activist networks um, were able to share resources, knowledge, and strategies to hold the pharmaceutical industry to account. And those are many of the networks that are still existing today um, and that are working on, on the issues of the, the COVID pandemic. Some of the visuals that you saw um, in, in the video was around the AIDS conference in, in Durban in 2000. And it was at this point that our president, Tobin Becky's AIDS denialism, and especially his skepticism around antiretrovirals um, came to the fore. So the treatment action campaign and, and treatment activists had to negotiate the, the, the great difficulties of an of a anti-science um, policy approach in, in South Africa. In 1999, uh, it was the start of the prevention of mother to child transmission case, um, where uh, civil society organizations challenged the, the South African government's AIDS denialist policy um, and rejection of antiretrovirals. And this case eventually landed up in our highest court, the Constitutional Court, um, that uh, came out resoundingly in support of, um, of the, the the case that was brought by the treatment action campaign um, and um, provided for the provision of, of nevirapine or other antiretrovirals to prevent HIV um, to un, unborn children. This also led to, to momentum in our national ARB rollout in April 2004. Um, in 2002, we used the camp, uh, competition law and especially, especially our competition commission um, to file a complaint, complaint against GlaxoSmithKline and Boeinger Ingelheim, uh, arguing that they violated competition law by abusing their dominance in the market and charging excessive prices for ARVs. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies reached the settlement in 2003, and that dramatically cut ARV prices. Against the background um, of these events, um, it's important to bear in mind the, the broader global uh, framework around um, trade and intellectual property. So you might know that the WTA adopted TRIPS in, in 1995, uh, 1994, and it makes provision for the safeguarding of intellectual property for a wide range of products um, for up to 20 years. Um, and it, as I've, I've noted before, it had a big impact on addressing the AIDS epidemic. Countries from the Global South fought for the Doha Declaration that focused on the public health consequences of TRIPS um, and provided specific safeguards. So the Doha Declaration in 2001 uh, were unequivocal that the TRIPS agreement should not, and should not and does not prevent members from taking measures to protect public health. And they confirmed that the, the agreement should be interpreted um, in a supportive manner to give substance to the right to protect public health, in particular, to promote access to medicines for all. Yet it's, it's regrettable that many of the DAR declaration flexibilities have not been used. Um, there's immense political pressure not to, to use the flexibilities. Um, for example, although the US agreed to the DAR declaration, the US trade policy never changed. Um, and the U.S. often impose significant pressures on country, countries not to use the, the TRIPS flexibilities and to in, increase or extend the highest levels of intellectual property protection. Governments who seek to use TRIPS um, are singled out. They, they often even placed on a watch list. Um, and pushing new trade agreements, the U.S. also seeks to extend IP protections beyond the level mandated by, by TRIPS. South Africa, to our shame, has not really used the DOA declaration. We haven't, yet, we haven't even once um, issued a compulsory license, which uh, points to the importance of robust domestic legislation um, in intellectual property and, and health, public health issues. I want to move from HIV uh, to COVID, and I'm, and I'm aware that, um, that there's only 18 minutes left. And I want to situate these, these figures are, are perhaps um, something that you are very familiar with. Uh, this is from the WHO dashboard. Um, the figures from yesterday uh, or two days ago showed that there were over 250 um, 
million cases confirmed of COVID, um, leading to more than 5 billion deaths. Um, and that there have been um, a number of significant, uh, thank you, I just saw the note, uh, a significant number of vaccine doses that have been um, administered. So where are all these vaccine um, vaccines going? As of two days ago, at least uh, just over half of the world population had received at least one dose of the, the COVID vaccine. Um, as we've noticed, there's been five billion doses that have been administered globally, um, and that there's almost 30 million that are administered each day. But yet, only less than 5% of people in low-income countries have received at least one dose. So this is a map. Um, that gets updated daily from our world and data. And you can see from, from the legend there um, that's, uh, that Africa is definitely not the dark continent. It is uh, very pale in comparison to, to other countries and their coverage of, of vaccines. Um, we, we ran a, a webinar recently um, entitled The 5% Continent to highlight the fact uh, that so few uh, so few people in, in Africa have been vaccinated, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that um, in a minute. So this is another graph um, that shows the vaccines administered by continent, and perhaps because you haven't seen it, it's the little sliver at the top um, that depicts uh, Africa's proportion. So this brings uh, us to the issue of vaccine equity, of course. Um, the, the fact that there's massive disparities between the global north and the global south. Um, the WHO Director General speaks about the world being on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure, um, and that this mere failure will be paid with the lives and livelihoods of the world's poorest countries. If we want to beat COVID-19 uh, as a planet, vaccine equity is absolutely key. And vaccine equity is essentially about the equitable distribution of, of vaccines worldwide. Um, I want to, to just briefly speak about, about global public goods. And I, and I draw here on Nevedita Shaksina's uh, work on, on global public goods. Um, a good, in this sense, is a product or an issue that can be either good or bad. Um, some people argue that national defense, peace, security, and even global warming can be seen as a, as a public good. Um, in the health context, it, it refers to programs, policies, and services that have a truly global impact on health. Usually, it, it refers to something that's beneficial. Often, a global public good is seen as non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Um, and Sakshina says in multilateral negotiations, these efforts have been accompanied by calls to designate the vaccine a global public good. Lacking a formal legal de definition, the phrase signals a commitment to ensure equitable access for all countries. Um, many of leading candidates of the vaccines, when she was writing this, um, was developed in, in research centers and universities in the global north. Um, but despite that, even before it can be proved that these this vaccines are uh, effective, they've already been patented by pharmaceutical companies, which means that they have a monopoly over the vaccine and they can decide where the vaccine goes and at what price. Um, this basically means that through patent rights, pharmaceutical companies control the know-how of manufacturing the, the, these vaccines, and this gives rise to artificial scarcity. So, it's very important to note that the research centers and the universities are funded by public money. So much of the vaccines development, the research and development um, that brought about successful and even unsuccessful vaccines have come from, from, the, public, from the public purse. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was an innovative suggestion by Costa Rica to create CTAB, the COVID-19 technology access pool. Um, through this mechanism, pharmaceutical companies would be invited to voluntarily share COVID-19 related knowledge, um, IP and data. 
Yet not one major pharmaceutical company with a WHO approved vaccine has contributed to CTAP. This is despite the fact that we know that there's been more than 5 million deaths and 250 million cases. So this brings us to, to the TRIPS waiver. Um, and as I've noted before, it's about how uh, the agreement, how most countries in the world deal with patents and the intellectual, uh, intellectual property rights um, and the Doha Declaration, um, softening some of, uh, some of the, the provisions of TRIPS. Um, and TRIPS provided an opportunity uh, opportunity to to flex some of the uh, the muscle of of the Doha declaration in October 2020 South Africa and India presented a trips waiver proposal um, the proposal specifically speaks to temporarily suspending IP rights so that COVID-19 vaccines and other new technologies are accessible for poor countries um, and it helps countries to override monopolies um, at that point until herd immunity is, is reached. Um, there's some discussion about whether uh, herd, not even, herd immunity, not herd immunity, whether herd immunity um, is still a useful con a concept. Um, and more than 100 countries have supported the waiver, except if you look at this graph, um, you can see that the countries uh, designated in, in red are countries that are opposing the waiver. The countries in green are uh, supporting it or co-sponsoring co it. Um, and uh, you can see uh, that your country in Canada, um, it's not clear what the, what the position is at the, at the moment, or at least um, by the 16th of November when uh, Medicine Science Frontiers did this infographic. So there's a very neat plot, plot in it, uh, a neat plot of countries um, that have a lot of vaccines um, and those who, who have pharmaceutical companies um, manufacturing vaccines um, and resistance to, to the TRIPS waiver. This is a graph from, from earlier this year. This is in, in January, 2021. Um, and it shows how different countries had already purchased uh, doses of the vaccine um, and how many times over uh, people in those countries would be able to, to vaccinate their populations. Uh, the EU had, had already bought 3.5 doses per person, uh, the US 3.7, Canada was 9.6. I think that's been downgraded now to, to six times as much vaccines as, as the population. Um, and that all in comparison to the African Union, which at that point was at 0.2%. It also goes to the issue of stockpiling. Uh, many countries in the global north are stockpiling vac uh, vaccines. Uh, a proportion of them um, are expiring. Um, and in this uh, BBC uh, insert uh, in, in September, they're asking whether many of, of these doses might be might go to waste, um, which means no one benefits from it. It uh, has, of course, given rise to a very strong resistance um, from activists uh, world over. Um, and some of the, the clips that I've played to you uh, are from the, the Free the Vaccine campaign, as well as the, the People's Vaccine campaign, um, who are, are doing important work in shining a light on these inequalities um, and leveraging and putting a lot of pressure on the World Trade Organization the discussions to, to be able to, to push the TRIPS waiver through. I want to spend a little bit of time to to speak to some of the the gist of of the lessons learned from from two decades ago, and some of the the lessons that uh, I'm going to to include in a video um, by my colleague Fatima Hassan um, have to do with uh, some of the the harder. Uh, some of the harder things we, we learned during the AIDS uh, 
pandemic um, and the importance of uh, analytical framework of exposing issues of power and control, especially the, the tight partnerships between governments and, and pharmaceutical companies. Um, the cynicism or the, uh, the critical engagement around donations and volunteerism uh, where where many people have, are rejecting the TRIPS waiver because they say there's there's a lot of donations um, that are coming in terms of, of, of vaccines to, to the global south. And uh, I think the slogan, um, we want justice, not charity, is an important one. Um, uh, during HIV, we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of promises about donations that that didn't materialize uh, the issue about domestic uh, laws to issue compulsory uh, licenses and the importance of mobilizing internationally one of the one of the the suggested readings that um that i included for today's seminar uh is a, a piece in the uh the british medical journal where uh fatima uh, and colleagues speak about the importance of a sustainable way forward is to globalize manufacturing so that disadvantaged countries no longer rely on on charity um, and how this was achieved in in HIV um, and how poorer countries required the relaxation of intellectual property rights technological transfer and being able to rapidly establish regional vaccine manufacturing hubs so what I would like to do is to, to play a clip from, from this webinar um, in which uh, Fatima speaks to some of these, these issues. Um, I'm also playing the clip because I'm, I'm aware that FIFA uh, was earlier a lecturer um, in this course um, and to share some of their thoughts uh, around the, the lessons learned. So I'm going to try and do my tech uh, again by seeing if I can play the, the video um, and have you watch it at the same time. You know, so much of this is very Fatima, I'd like to come back to you because some of both what Peter have said and Kamran has just talked about reminded me and you know they said it very clearly that we've been through this before you know so much of this is very reminiscent of the the struggle for HIV meds and you mentioned you know this notion that we couldn't take our medication on time what was the point there was the you know the fact that Nelson Mandela's administration was sued by 38 or 40 pharmaceutical companies with the support of the US government and Europeans so I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that you know in the moments where we feel very depressed and we think that we're not going to win this battle you know what are the lessons that you can bring us from that time because I know that you uh, despite the fact that you look very useful were in in that battle as well back then and anything else that you'd like to add or respond to to what um, Eddie of uh, the other panelists have said thanks so I mean I think you know just to echo what Cameron and Peter and Tifa have said um in many ways, the, the way in which this pandemic has been managed has been worse, right, than the HIV crisis, because we thought we wouldn't have a repeat of that. We I mean, thought we wouldn't have a repeat of the greed and the hoarding and the refusal to share knowledge in the middle of a pandemic where you have a life saving intervention. So, you know, Cameron and Peter talked about how remarkably we got these vaccines, multiple of vaccines that are considered safe and effective. They have emergency use authorization. And what happened? All of the supplies was allocated to the global north, uh, very low targets for the global south, where black and brown people happen to live, which is why, you know, I'm going to go back to the point about racism, because for me, this just feels like um, the racism wasn't even disguised. You know, in HIV AIDS, it was initially, whereas in this case, we thought it would be so different, there would be that solidarity, the sharing of knowledge, and that did happen. So, you know, the lesson from HIV AIDS, I think, that just became clearer last night when we had a panel discussion with David Kester, who's in charge of the Biden White House team on the COVID-19 response. And, you know, incredulously, in October 2021, we're having the same discussions we should have had, uh, you know, one imagines a year ago, where, where a government like the US, which is considered to be so powerful, that has put a lot of funding into particularly Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson and uh, Moderna's vaccine, is saying to us that they are still negotiating 
with the CEOs and the boards of these pharmaceutical companies. They are still having a conversation about manufacturing and sharing of knowledge. And so, you know, I don't know if, if any of you heard the conversation last night, but it was really disheartening because I think it goes to what Kamran and Peter talked about, and that is financial greed. There is so much interest in extracting profit and extracting wealth and extracting, you know, this, this number of overnight billionaires are our colleagues and people's vaccine alliance have reported on this. Um, that they that they even with five percent or the two point six percent of vaccination in low income countries, which is really, really I think a political embarrassment and economic embarrassment, social embarrassment, um, that even with those low figures and COVAX cutting its own forecast and saying we simply don't have supplies, right? That that companies are still sitting around the table and having these conversations with elected leaders who are saying to them, share the tax, and they're like, no, not this month, maybe next week. No, maybe next year, only with that company, not on these terms and conditions. No, you can't export. Yes, you can export. So, so the question goes to, can we have so much self-interest in money and extracting profit that you are willing to withhold a life-saving technology to millions and millions of people around the world. And so I think I agree with Peter. What are the boards of these pharmaceutical companies doing? They have a fiduciary duty. How can the chairperson of the board of Moderna refuse to share the technology um, with the rest of the world, be celebrated and get an award for leadership? How can this be the leadership? The CEO of Pfizer said that the reason why Africans are not getting more vaccines is because they're vaccine hesitant and that you know, it, it will take some time for people in Africa to be convinced. I mean, he said, uh, you know, counters other things which Tian and I would like to address. He also said that Africa is not the hardest hit continent, which is not exactly true. So, how can you have a situation that CEOs of pharmaceutical companies have more power than than the DG of the WHO, than elected leaders? Um, and I think it goes to the fact that these elected leaders, particularly Boris Johnson, you know, formerly Angela Merkel, a lot of these governments have actually propped up these pharmaceutical companies. And we saw that with HIV AIDS, is that you cannot exercise so much power and control unless you have the political support of those closest to you. And we've seen that with the TRIPS waiver. The countries that are blocking the TRIPS waiver are countries that are fundamentally uh, led by people who have political parties that are heavily funded by the pharmaceutical lobby, all those companies are headquartered there. The fact that the German government cannot force BioNTech to share its technology with the rest of the world, the fact that the Biden administration is still having nice conversations with, you know, three leading companies that could actually take us out of this pandemic much faster, tells you, I think, the levels of greed that we are dealing with and also the levels of, of power, which is obviously very reminiscent and similar to the HIV AIDS crisis. In some respects, these are the same companies, but none of us ever uh, thought last year when we gave the warning bells around never trust volunteerism, never trust benevolence, never trust donations, because we've learned this from the HIV AIDS crisis. None of us thought that it would still take so long for world leaders in this pandemic, because it's we're so interconnected with this pandemic, with variants circulating, with you know potential uh, additional waves, and like Peter said, what comes after Delta? I think Cameron said, what comes after Delta? None of us thought that political leaders would be so scared. And and I mean, you know, let's also just lay a little bit of blame at African leaders, right? So, I mean, you know, the South African government and Indian government have been pushing for the trips waiver, but you knew the kind of blockages and obstacles you would face. I mean, we, we all hoped we did it. So have we set up our laws to be ready to issue compulsory licenses? Why are we so scared of take, taking on pharmaceutical companies? I mean, we know why, we know the trade pressure, but if you're not gonna use those powers, I think it's what you know the DG of the WHO said last week, why have provisions in the TRIPS agreement on a TRIPS waiver if you're not going to use it? If you're not gonna use it in this pandemic, we never, we never gonna use it. So, yeah, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of Asia move moments of, of the HIV AIDS crisis, but I think Peter is right. What turned the tide on HIV AIDS was that all of us basically mobilized to force the drug companies to issue 
multiple licenses to increase the number of manufacturers. Until then, we didn't have a turning point. And so when people see our response to Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson and Johnson, it's not because we are anti-private companies or anti the pharmaceutical industry. It's because we know that time is against us. People are getting sick and dying. We don't force these companies through public pressure and public activism because governments are not going to get us on their own. We have to increase the public pressure on these pharmaceutical companies and their boards to actually do the right thing and right now to scale up manufacturing, participate in the mRNA hubs and stop diverting supplies to richer countries that already have sufficient supplies. Thank you. On that, on that note, and the special emphasis that Fatima placed. A lot of people wonder, when's sorry. the right time to get tested? Could you get an STD test right sorry, away, or is it better to... Uh, to... On the note of the importance of mobilization, and especially to force pharmaceutical companies to, to share their recipes, um, I think I'm going to, to conclude there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marlies. Um, powerful bringing together of a lot of experiences through HIV AIDS uh, to the current pandemic, uh, a lot of parallels, obviously. Um, so I just wanna remind folks that we'd love to get a bit of a discussion going. We have some time. We typically go until about 20 after the hour. Um, so please do feel free to put some questions into the Q&A. Um, and then I'll uh, repeat those for the group as a whole. Um, just to start the discussion off, I guess I, I enjoyed seeing how you brought together a lot of different people in the field that have been uh, you know, working both historically and at present uh, to improve the supply essentially and access uh, globally to COVID vaccines. The, I, I was curious if you wanted to sort of situate your own experience, having worked, as we talked about early on in the introduction, in a range of different advocacy organizations. Because in some ways, you know, what we're hearing or, or what you shared with us was that um, there's a lot of similarities between what happened with HIV AIDS and the current pandemic. And, and, and yet here we are again. Right. So in some ways, it's kind of a dis de very depressing note around corporate power and th the ineffectiveness of advocacy to alter that or push back against it. So I wondered if you coming from perhaps adjacent spaces in public health, different organizations, if you had any reflections about what's new here or what aren't we doing? What should we be doing? Um, uh, just either at a personal level in terms of you're moving into the space coming from outside of it. Thanks, Matthew. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and uh, it, it makes me think about, uh, about being, being in, in spaces that, uh, that always had public health and access to medicines issues, but probably a bit more tangentially. So I noted that, uh, most of my work in in the last while has been around law reform um, on on sex work, specifically in the decriminalization of of sex work, and the work that I've been involved in around there has been access to healthcare services and the importance of having uh, enabling health context to to speak to sp particularly mo um, marginalized people, and. The, the work that I've been doing in, in gender-based violence um, more broadly, it's also been around uh, policy and law reform to acknowledge the, the impact of gender-based violence on, um, on levels of, of safety and, and well-being and health in, in South Africa, but of, of course, um, uh, broader, much broader than that. And I think the the issue of the difficulties within um, within the health sector, and especially because of uh, because of the emphasis placed on on profits and um, often on uh, uh, yeah on money and and the way uh, that 
profit margins as well as the the stigma that often attaches to particularly marginalized groups how those reinforce each other um, to force uh, the people who often need healthcare services the most, how they, they get forced even more uh, to the margins. And I think Paul Farmer spoke very eloquently about the, the fault lines um, of, of epidemics and how they, they track the marginalization, um, the marginalized populations and reinforce some of, uh, some of that, that structural violence. Um, I think something that that struck me in in the comparison of the work uh, that we did early on in HIV and and now in COVID in a in a much sped up form um, is the the social solidarity the, the the global solidarity and I think that that's something that's very important to point out how the the networks of activists who who came together with HIV and how it was truly a, a global response how many of those people are, are still working uh, very strongly in issues of, of intellectual property and access to medicines and have been able to reactivate um, in working in, in tandem with, with people all over the world, especially the, the advocacy around the TRIPS waiver, um, the trust and the relationships that have been forged over many years, um, how activists could pick that up and, and just run with those. Um, and I think those are those are important lessons in in terms of how uh, I would say capitalism has has become even more robust in in the last uh, the last few decades. The consolidation of pharmaceutical power um, and political power specifically, but that there's been such a coordinated and important pushback uh, by human rights activists, academics, um, uh, and and advocates. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's. That's very thoughtful. Uh, I mean, I think in some ways it's it's amazing to see this pushback coalesce quickly and in full force and bring out those lessons and try and mobilize. I guess the the sort of challenge that occurs to me at the same time is how to sustain that between pandemics when you know there is this you know obvious stark inequality that you can point to 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 build public support um, and support across organizations uh, when that's less easy to do um that's how these sort of structures seem to be reproduced um again and again and again but i uh, really appreciate that response we have we have a question from the audience um uh thank you for your inspiring presentation marlies Cont companies and countries adopt different approaches about the exclusivities on different types of covid medical countermeasures i think using that broadly to capture drugs vaccines and other things like you know, testing devices. Uh, for example, the US supported the TRIPS waiver in relation to COVID-19 vaccines, but not necessarily in relation to other countermeasures. And Pfizer, although I think this might need to be Merck, um, uh, didn't contribute to any uh, technology pool on vaccines, uh, recently announced that will issue voluntary licen licensing of its oral antiviral therapy to the medicines patent pool. I think that's Merck, not Pfizer, but I, I forget the details. What do you think underpins the shifts in approaches and strategies? Mm. Thanks, Matthew. A big thank you for that question. And I, I'm going to start off with an important point that Matthew made um, in an article earlier this year around how vaccine manufacturers have strong incentives to, to keep the pandemic going, right? Um, I think Matthew talked about it as being a durable franchise. Um, and I think, that pharmaceutical companies have have held on to that power that they that they are still holding on to that power uh, at all costs um and that what what i think where, where there's been some some minor concessions um those have been uh, probably precipitated by the 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 moral arguments and the the global push um by activists, where citizens um, within in, within countries in the global north have said um, no more, um, that countries that are blocking the, the trips waiver need to to stop doing so, and that there's been uh, a lot of push on on pharmaceutical companies, hopefully through their shareholders, hopefully through their boards, but also through the general public, um, to make those um, to make some of those concessions. I don't think there's been a major shift at all. Um, I do think that uh, 
that the, the this approach, while it is is heartening, uh, that you that you refer to, is by no means the no means the extent of what we would want and what we need in terms of of the changes that would be brought about by the the trips waiver, and that would essentially be uh, around the transfer of know how. Um, for people to make their own vaccines and for for some of the, the some of the uh, materials that are needed um, to to make some of the vaccines that are are held still in, in countries that that manufacture uh, manufacture the vaccine. So you need to be able to do the transfer of 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 know how uh, in a in a much more robust way to to radically uh, increase the supply of vaccines and, and other medicines. So I do think there is some chipping away um, and that this is a good example of it, but it's by no means uh, it's by no means what we what we really need. Um, in some ways it might distract from the bigger questions around IP. And the fact if we don't use the TRIPS waiver in the, the COVID-19 pandemic, when when will we when will we ever use it? Well said. Um, another question from the audience, are there any organizations in particular that you think are doing good advocacy work uh, on, the, on the patent issue during COVID-19 in particular? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Susie. That's a, that's a, a great question. Um, I'm mostly uh, in touch with, with some of the, the organizations that, that we work with, um, and they are generally uh, Grouped together under the People's Vaccine campaign, um, and some of the links at the the end of my presentation, some of the really creative videos. Um, I don't think there will be time to to show the the athletes video um, at the end of my presentation that I think is really innovative. Um, the People's Vaccine uh, campaign bring together a a large number of international NGOs um, and. Uh, and as well as academic organizations um, that have a very clear advocacy ask um, around the, the TRIPS waiver and uh, putting pressure on the World Trade Organization. So my entry point would be the People's Vaccine Initiative, um, and they have sparked a lot of regional and country-specific uh, country specific, uh, splinter cells. There's a, a People's Vaccine uh, campaign in South Africa. There's a uh, uh, African-wide uh, people's vaccine movement um, that looks specifically at issues in, within Africa, and they all tie together globally um, through the through the the, the global network. Um, so that would be uh, my my key entry point. Um, and then second would be Doctors Without Borders. The MSF Access campaign um, is really robust, and it is situated in a lot of uh, expertise on intellectual property um, and academic research. And it's it's worthwhile uh, mentioning uh, Public Citizen in uh, the US and also Knowledge Ecology International that are doing um, a lot of uh, a lot of academic work as well as as research to bring out some of the uh, some of the particularly uh, disturbing aspects around non-disclosure agreements, um, around the, the profits um, that pharmaceutical companies make um, and how that play, play out on a, on a global scale. Then the last one uh, that I particularly like is called the Free the Vaccine uh, campaign that's, uh, yeah, that's been forged by a number of, of activists world over and, and led by the Centre for Artistic Activism in New York. Um, that uses creative advocacy techniques um, to uh, and the arts and especially uh, especially theatre um, to to challenge people's um, to challenge people's views and to do so in a in a creative way. Um, so those would be my my key my key organisations. Thank you. There is hope, I guess, in some ways around the, the, the mobilization and the sort of growth of civil society. I just hope we can sustain their actions long beyond the pandemic, as crucial as they are right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we're just about out of time. So unless there are other questions in the Q&A, um, I just wanted to uh, 
uh, close by thanking Dr. Richter, but before I do that, I'll just one housekeeping point to share with folks. Um, so as uh, longtime followers know of the series, uh, as much as we're privileged to have guests come from afar, sometimes in person outside of the present context, um, we've been operating online uh, for some time uh, through COVID. The tentative plan, which we are very fortunate to be able to work towards, is that we will be back in person next semester. So this is our last seminar of the current semester, uh, speaking in very university-oriented terms there. But in January, we're hopeful that we will be able to get together in person and uh, in future be able to host uh, speaker, speakers like Dr. Richter to come and attend and, and bring our audience back together. So just wanted to make a note for our attendees that um, we'll tentatively be planning to be back in person in January, so stay tuned for more details in the new year. Uh, with that housekeeping note said, um, I hope everyone can give, join me in giving a big virtual round of applause for uh, Marlies for joining us. It's especially late in South Africa today, uh, or at least well into the evening on a Friday night, so we appreciate it for that reason as well. But Obviously, these issues are front and center. We applaud the work uh, that you and others in civil society are doing. So I uh, cannot thank you enough for sharing your experience and perspective and bringing uh, to the fore that history around antiretrovirals as well. Um, so on that note, I think we, unless you wanted to any, offer any parting words, Dr. Richter, I just wanted to say thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, and we'll see you hopefully soon.